Um, so moving on through the um, four nations of the UK and Ireland, um, we've now got um, Dr Paul Belford uh, talking about Wales. Paul has been director of the Fluid Palace Archaeological Trust for eight years, um, apparently only the third person to hold that post in the 45 year history of the Welsh Archaeological Trusts. Um, Paul's background is as a field archaeologist working on a range of medieval urban sites in England and Germany and going on to pursue interests in post-medieval industrial archaeology. His PhD was on 16th century industrialisation. And more recently, he's returned to prehistoric and early medieval landscapes. He's an active member of the uh, Chartered Institute for Field Archaeologists and the European Association of Archaeologists, currently chair of the EAA, EAA Urban Archaeology Community, in which role he recently published the book um, on managing urban archaeology in Europe. Uh, Paul, if you're happy and the slides are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karenza. Um, can I share... Can you see my slides? Yes, that's great. That's fantastic. Okay, let me just get that up and running. Okay. As for, Paul, I'll give you a five minute warning. That's very kind. Thank you. So, um, hello, everybody, and, and thank you very much for the introduction, Carenza, and for the invitation as well. I, I'm going to offer a slightly different perspective uh, from my fellow speakers um, because, as we've seen in Scotland and to some extent in Ireland, large scale infrastructure development is, is less frequent in Wales and has tended to avoid. Uh, medieval settlements where it can, focusing instead on former industrial landscapes. Therefore, I'm going to talk more generally about development-driven archaeology overall and what it can or could and has or has not told us about medieval settlement in Wales. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on process than outcomes in my talk uh, because I do think that um, there are some shortcomings, I think, in the way we do things, and, and we could do more. And I want to explore how that might how that might take place. But let's start with some context. Um, the map on the left shows Wales in dark blue. Wales is currently part of the United Kingdom, which is shown in medium blue. Um, and the map on the right shows Wales divided into four blocks. And these are the territories of the four Welsh archaeological trusts. These are Gwyneth, Clwyd Powys, Dufford and Glamorgan Gwent. These regional trusts were established in the mid-1970s and undertake a variety of functions. Among other things, they deliver planning advice to local authorities in their respective regions, which they do with funding from those authorities and from CADU. Uh, CADU also funds the Welsh uh, Archaeological Trust to maintain regional historic environment records and undertake heritage management work. I'll come back to the Welsh system shortly. But first, I want to turn to the research context. Um, this recent overview in uh, medieval settlement research addresses familiar themes, the changing nature of landscape and its relation to settlement, the role of agriculture in rural settlement, settlement morphology and contraction, industry, material culture and so on. Yet this remains a very Anglo-centric view. And this is not a criticism of the authors, but the nature of the resource. And this review makes two key points which I hope to address today. First, Wales is neglected. And second, we need more joined up thinking. Now, this is not a new situation. Um, and although many of the seminal texts for medieval settlement studies do mention Wales, they are usually only partial references or ones which are out of date. Partly because of their scope and partly because of their date, there is very little reference to development driven archaeology in a modern planning context, let alone infrastructure. The same is true of specialist journals, relatively few papers on Wales, only a handful of which relate to development driven projects. So does this reflect the amount of work being undertaken in Wales and the quality of the information generated? For the first part of my talk, I want to look at the planning context and some of the tools and mechanisms that have a specific bearing on medieval settlement research in Wales. I then want to move uh, on to look at some of the results of this work and how we might think about doing things better. So although the system in Wales is different, the legal framework starts from the same place, polluter pays principles, PPG 16. PPG 16 was replaced in Wales by two Welsh office circulars in 1996. In the same year, local government reorganisation created 25 new local planning authorities, so 22 unitary authorities in the three national parks. Two years later, the process of devolution began and the autonomy of Wales decision making has subsequently been strengthened. 
Planning and heritage are devolved matters. Planning Policy Wales developed from the early 2000s and continues to evolve. Among other things, the Historic Environment Act in 2016 made historic environment records in Wales statutory and created specific historic environment planning advice, TAM 24. Meanwhile, in England, PPG 16 was later replaced by PPS 5 and then MPPF. So the two systems have gradually moved further apart. And I think this is important um, because it's often overlooked. There is this divergence between the English and the Welsh system. In all of this, the Welsh archaeological trusts have remained stable and constant. As this diagram shows, these changes in legislation, administration and heritage management structures, uh, big shifts evident in 96, 98 and 2007 and again more recently. So let's look at the scale of planning led archaeology in Wales. The Welsh Archaeological Trusts make archaeological recommendations on around 4% of planning applications. And these levels of planning work are comparable with those in England. But of course, those of you familiar with the situation in England um, will see that the numbers are very much lower. In fact, around 5% of the level of activity in England. This is largely explained by population. Um, and also by uh, development pressure. Um, and some parts of Wales have some of the lowest population densities and some of the lowest levels of development activity, therefore, in the United Kingdom. And, and Paris, I would say, is probably comparable to the Highlands and Islands um, and parts of Ireland um, in, in its uh, low population density and low development pressures. Now, turning to medieval settlements, um, attempts have been made in the past to try and characterise the resource and to develop priorities for planning led archaeology in historic settlements. Historic settlement cores are identified in the 1990s and this was followed by landscape level studies in the late 1990s and early 2000s. However, coverage has not always been consistent and some areas have been better served than others. <clears throat> for example, understanding of small towns and settlements um, is well developed in the Clwyd Paris and David areas, whereas in, <coughs> pardon me, Whereas in the Gwynedd region, there is a better understanding of relationships between medieval settlements and their hinterlands. Archaeologically defined historic settlement cores have been refined since the early 1990s, and they're among a number of tools designed to preserve and protect cultural heritage. Conservation areas, another one shown here in blue, often overlapping, but with these are statutory designations which take setting and other things into account. Although on a small scale, the contribution of development driven projects has increased dramatically over the last 30 years. And this graph shows the proportion of development driven fieldwork projects as a proportion of all projects, rising from around 30% in 1991 to 90% in the 2010s. And this is just fieldwork projects. If desk based assessments and such like were also included, then the proportion would be much higher. In fact, only 54% of these projects are development driven fieldwork projects. And this is talking about in specifically in historic settlements. Uh, and these fieldwork projects are specifically building recording, watching briefs, evaluations and excavations. And of these, only 30% are controlled by archaeologists. In other words, evaluations and excavations. 45% are watching briefs, which archaeologists have much less control over. And these proportions fluctuate a bit, but have been fairly consistent over time. And here's a graph showing the, the relative proportions of those projects over time. Uh, the bars in this graph show the total numbers of development driven archaeological fieldwork projects in the Clwyd Pass region each year. The different colours represent different types of projects. The red line shows the gross value added for construction sectors in the region. So that's a, a signal of economic uh, buoyancy in, in construction and development, and unsurprisingly, there's a close relationship between the two. However, not all historic settlements are equal. A small number of settlements see a large number of projects, whereas the majority of settlements see very few. Analysis of the Clwyd Paris region found that half of all projects took place in just 19 of more than 250 settlements. Of these, six settlements accounted for nearly a quarter of all development-driven fieldwork projects. In contrast, more than two-thirds of settlements saw three or fewer projects over 25 years, and that's the big purple wedge in this chart. This long tail is shown in the bar graph in the main chart here. The top 30 settlements accounted for over 60% of all fieldwork projects 
Um, and as we've already seen, three quarters of these involve some sort of below ground excavation, but the majority of, of this is through watching reefs. The proportions of these different types of projects are shown here for the top 30 settlements. Although the overall proportions of the top 30, shown in the red box, are, are more or less uh, comparable, um, there is considerable variation between settlements in terms of the types of projects which are undertaken. And this is a consequence of the sensitivity of the archaeology, the types of development um, and the circumstances under which that's taking place. So where does this very varied picture leave us in terms of understanding? And the first point to make is about the unevenness of the sample. Particular settlements tend to be more prosperous. These settlements see more development and development pressure, and as a result, they see more development-driven archaeology. A related fact is that the majority of settlements where more development-driven archaeology has been done are the planned towns of the 13th and 14th centuries, where the Welsh or English in origin. Earlier settlements which did not thrive, or were in some way eclipsed by later ones, as well as later ones which struggled to develop as their founder intended, are generally places where little or no development takes place today. Therefore, there are some gaps in the evidence. Many settlements are said to have pre-conquest origins, in many cases ecclesiastical. However, in most cases, this evidence is circumstantial. And whilst relationships between circular churchyards or um, uh, car carved stones and associated or even subsequent developments can be discerned through landscape analysis, this is not part of development-driven archaeology. Similarly, much has been said about medieval reuse of prehistoric sites, and there are notable examples in Wales where hilltop enclosures in particular have been reoccupied and refortified in the Middle Ages. However, even though prehistoric finds and even features occur quite often in development-driven archaeological projects in medieval settlements, there is no evidence to suggest that this is anything other than coincidence. Symbolic appropriation of Roman sites is well known, for example, Carnarvon, Carleon, and of course, Cardiff. But development-driven work rarely finds a direct Roman antecedent. One exception to this has been at Ruthin uh, in Denbyshire, where an evaluation found second century features filled with metalworking debris in the core of the town established in the 1270s and sealed by 13th century layers. Some Welsh towns are, of course, incomparable icons of medieval settlement planning. And here is Conway, one of the finest of those with its castle at the top, church, grid plan, and its wonderful circuit of town walls. However, this is very much the exception. And even here, development-driven archeology span has revealed very little about the growth and development of the town and its defenses. There have only been five or six um, very small scale interventions in Conway, none of which have found any significant medieval remains. However, in other well-known examples, nothing of the defensive circuit survives above ground at all. But we have seen good results from development-driven archaeology, and Flint is aware a rare example of this. Some very exciting new discoveries indeed. Between 2015 and 2018, Archaeology Wales undertook a series of evaluations and excavations on and around the line of the town walls and discovered that substantial remains of the town bank and ditch survived, along with a range of burgage plot boundaries, drainage features, and so on, together with other occupational evidence, both in situ and dumped in the ditch for corn drying, metalworking, pottery manufacture, and leatherworking, in fact. Um, the bank and the ditch were generally 14 to 15 metres wide, no evidence for palisade, but some sections of the lower part of the ditch um, had been given a stone revetment. And none of this was visible above ground except as fossilised street plans. So that's, that was really exciting development. But elsewhere, defences have proved elusive. Even where good landscape or documentary evidence exists for them, development-driven workers failed to find evidence for gates, walls, or early defensive, other defensive infrastructure in most places. In some cases, this will be because the areas excavated are too small or too shallow, but elsewhere, as actually in Idlois, where quite a large series of excavations have been done around the putative site of the castle, um, with no results whatsoever, we ought to question whether these defences existed in the first place. 
Hay is another example where development-driven archaeology has identified survival of parts of the town walls that were previously thought to have been lost. Hay also provides a case of hiatus in settlement development. Here the street and an adjacent walkway um, were laid out in the late 13th or 14th century, and you can see that street in grey on the, on the plan on the left-hand side. The plot was partly developed then, but then abandoned. Early post-medieval development pushed the property boundary building line out into the former street. Hay is, of course, unusual in having had a large number of interventions. Um, elsewhere, the picture is more mixed, but there is good evidence for early layout and maintenance of Burgish plot boundaries. Um, and this evidence is fairly widespread in a range of settlements of different sizes and origins. In some places, these boundaries remained in place right through to the post-medieval period. Elsewhere, there was clearly merging and shifting of burgages through the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries. There isn't much time to discuss buildings in detail today. I'll only pause just to say that perhaps obviously the best results obtained when building recording and below ground archaeology are integrated and combined with scientific dating such as dendrochronology. Again, as a general rule, more substantial and perhaps it may be inferred higher status buildings tend to predominate in the archaeological record. And these are often some of the earliest structures in planned or planted settlements. And we see here on the left of Bishop's Palace, um, part of the very early development of Bangor in northwest Wales, and down in um, mid Wales, southern mid Wales in Radnorshire, um, another 13th century building uh, that was part of the early development of New Radna. However, there are two caveats here. First, the scale of development driven archaeology often means that building remains are only partial. Second, the apparent abandonment or demolition of a well-built structure and its replacement by a more flimsy one does not necessarily imply decline of a settlement. It is wrong, I think, to extrapolate the particular history of a plot and all of our modern assumptions about building quality to the wider landscape and the wider settlement history. Cards and corn dryers are common enough features, as are smithing debris and other evidence for local trades and manufacture. However, archaeology in Wales is still a long way from being able to address the relationships and networks between small and large settlements in lifestyles that were simultaneously rural and urban. So why is this? I think it's partly because of the methods and approaches we choose to deploy. Watching briefs are of limited scope their locations and circumstances are not of the archaeologist's choosing, and only very rarely do they encounter anything of significance, or if they do, its context is often lost or obscured. Evaluations, too, are often on a very small scale. Quite frequently, they encounter features like that on the top left, clearly a cut feature, but is it a post hole or a ditch, a beam slot or something else? There is little scope for either contracting archaeologists or curatorial archaeologists to sit back and think about joining up the dots. In a sense, this was the aim of the regional and thematic research frameworks developed from the 1990s and still current and still ongoing. However, this process has not always served Wales well, largely because of the lack of resource and time that's been able to be put into it. So this does leave us with some unresolved questions. Even on a macro scale, we have learned relatively little about changing settlement morphology. And I use here the example of Knighton. Its Welsh name means town on the dike. And here is Offa's Dyke running along the western side of the town. The original settlement is assumed to have been around the castle. Later, a borough charter implies a relocation of the marketplace. The regular grid plan of the area to the northeast, which includes the church, is in contrast to the earlier core. It has led some observers to conclude that this was a medieval development. However, all of these evaluations and watching briefs have taken place in Knighton, yet only one has found any medieval evidence at all. A few shows of pottery in this case. So this brings us to late medieval decline another theme of old. And whilst there is no doubt that some settlements were developed, uh, were never developed to their designers' potential, and here New Radnor and Flint are offered as classic examples, 
This was not universally the case. The existence of open space within a settlement does not and should not imply economic or social inactivity. But there is still a tendency among some colleagues to make that casual link, particularly when focused on very detailed and specific sites rather than looking at the wider picture. And that brings me to the final point, really, this question of settlements in the landscape. We need to better understand the relationships between different types of settlement and the landscapes in which they are situated and the rural urban mixture of lifestyles that existed within both of these networks, often simultaneously, as well as the networks between settlements of different sizes and their relationships um, to other uh, landscape interventions. So having identified some problems, I suppose I can talk about how we might go and resolve these, these gaps in the evidence base. And that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much, Carenza. Um, and so in general, I, I, it's clear that development different driven projects in Wales, where we're lacking these large scale infrastructure projects, at least those that touch on medieval settlements, or indeed swerve to avoid medieval settlements, arguably quite rightly so, what we're left with is generally projects that are quite small. Where we've had better results are from development driven projects that have either excavated larger areas or that they've made repeated visits to the same or adjacent sites or indeed both things have happened. And this is when the archaeology has been better served. But doing more is not always going to be the answer. And as I said at the beginning, infrastructure projects in Wales have not served the archaeology of medieval rural settlements particularly well. Pipelines and road schemes have tended to go past. Whilst there's clearly been a lot of development driven archaeology, it has not yet been possible to draw meaningful understanding directly from the planning led work alone. So there is a need for more synthesis of existing data and this touches on what both John and Aidan have, have already said really. But the question really is who's going to do this synthesis? There's been a tendency for this kind of work to attract large research council funding for major universities and consortia. Such projects are and have been very valuable. And we can think of Roman rural settlement um, and, and, other, and other similar projects. But they also stand alone and perhaps represent a fixed point in time. I think better public value would be achieved and also better support for more sustainable archaeological profession when commercial and curatorial practitioners are also fully included in these projects. This would integrate with historic environment records to create live data sets with real world application. We also need to find a way of situating these pinpricks of archaeological knowledge into wider landscape context. In the past, as I mentioned earlier, there was funding through the Cadu Grante programme for the Welsh Archaeological Trust for these sorts of studies, and particular progress was made in parts of Wales, notably the North West. Equally, Andy Seaman and others have done good work with GIS in identifying and predicting locations of settlements in South East Wales. However, I don't feel we're harnessing the full potential of GIS, let alone LIDAR and other techniques as we might be in Wales. Wales is a small archaeological community and there is a tendency to look inwards and with this a tendency also to leave some long held assumptions unchallenged and perhaps leave some senior figures unchallenged too. I feel we should look towards, look outwards more to comparable places in our own archipelago, Ireland and parts of Scotland most obviously, as well as elsewhere in Europe, and perhaps let go of some of our reverence for the establishment. Finally, the large infrastructure projects that others have mentioned are all ultimately publicly funded and often lavishly so. The large number of very small projects in Wales does not include an overhead for public benefit. So some other means needs to be found to ensure that this work does deliver public benefit. And realistically, this might mean looking again at the way in which development driven archaeology is funded and procured in Wales. In conclusion, I would say, as Aidan did, that there's been a great deal of new information, but perhaps rather less understanding. Thank you very much.